Welcome to today's webinar about Marble Hill. As we prepare to open in the spring of this year, a huge amount of work has been going on behind the scaffold and behind that hoarding. And it's with real delight that I get a chance to, to welcome two of our fantastic conservation team to tell you a little bit more about the work that is continuing to happen. We haven't quite finished, but it is a great opportunity to be able to share a little um, and just give you that sneaky peek. Um, and we're very pleased that you're here to join us today. Marble Hill is being revived and it's thanks to uh, funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund and the charity English Heritage itself that we have been able to make some really tangible changes. And that's everything from the landscape being invested in, some of our heritage aspects being brought back, but also a huge amount of planting of diverse um, bushes and plants to make sure that it's a space that's more biodiverse and safeguarding that amazing nature for the future generations. We've created a great cafe and you can go to the cafe and have a cup of tea and know that you're giving back to the charity with every sip. Of course, you can always have membership to English Heritage, but it's lovely to have the cafe on site that will support the work of Marble Hill and indeed the wider charity itself. We've created a lovely new play area and lots of events. And thank you for being part of this, which is one of many, many which are available to see again on the Marble Hill YouTube channel, but also lots of physical events, everything from building a stag beetle loggery to our arts in the park. But we're not here to talk about those other elements of the project. Today, we're here to talk about the house. Marble Hill House will be open in the spring and it's going to be free and open five days a week. And there's even a lift that's been put in to make sure that it's much more accessible. So I'm really, really delighted to be able to welcome our two fantastic speakers this evening, to be able to tell you a little bit more about the huge amount of work and dedication that both they have put in and indeed a huge amount of professionals who've been able to help bring back Marble Hill and revive it. So I'd like to introduce tonight Wendy Richardson and Sarah Lambarth, who are going to tell you a little bit more and give you that sneaky peek behind those scaffolds. Hello, thank you for joining us today. So we're going to talk to you um, about safeguarding Marble Hill's history and heritage through, also, through just some of the bits of conservation work that have been done to the building. Just to give you a bit of background, Marble Hill is a Palladian villa set on the River Thames and it was built by Henrietta Howard. Henrietta Howard was the mistress of George II, but she was so much more than that. And if you'd like to find out more about her, you can find out on our website or the Marble Hill Revived website or our YouTube channel. And what we want to do is give you a sneaky peek behind the scenes, as, as Rachel said, behind the scaffold and the barriers and talk about activities that have been happening in the house that you may not notice necessarily when you visit and give you an idea of some of the work that goes into the more hidden elements of the project. So we're going to talk through today about protecting some of the historic surfaces during the works to the building, working with a specialist carpenter to carefully lift up the mahogany floorboards, caring for and preparing the floors for the return of the collection with the help from our amazing conservation volunteer team. Then we, Sarah's going to give you a bit more information about our new heating system, environmental control, the paintings conservation work that we've had done and specifically some conservation works we've had done to stabilize a lacquer screen. And then we'll give you a chance to answer questions afterwards. So to start off with, the first question that I am going to answer myself is, why did we need to remove the historic floorboards at all? So as part of the project work at Marble Hill House, the whole house needed to be rewired as the electrics put in in the 1960s were starting to fail. Initially, we planned to remove as few floorboards as possible to allow for this to happen. But during investigations, we discovered, as is often the case in historic buildings, that there was asbestos in some of the floor voids. To allow for the rewiring to occur, all of the asbestos needed to be removed so that the voids could be accessed safely. And this required almost every floorboard on the first floor of Marble Hill House to be removed. Since the floors had to be removed under asbestos conditions, safe enclosures had to be constructed in each historic interior in such a way that the enclosures themselves would not damage the historic fabric of the building. Uh, we used pressure to hold wooden frames in position with foam and a special corrugated plastic board between this and any historic surface. 
the plastic of the enclosures could then be sealed to the wooden frames without causing any damage. And here you can see the image to the left shows the inside of one of these enclosures. I'd just like to say that's before any asbestos removal work was done. And um, then the image on the right shows how we set up ventilation for the enclosures as they had to vent outside. So we created uh, a separate, almost like an inner door to protect the environment inside the house and stop the weather coming in. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the removal of the floorboards themselves. So the conservation team worked very closely with specialist carpenters and our main contractor to plan and remove the floorboards as safely as possible. Prior to removal of the floorboards, the contractors drew up a very detailed scale drawings of each of the floors, and you can see one here over on the left hand side of the screen. And each of the floorboards was allocated a specific code number, as you can see here. As each floorboard was lifted in asbestos conditions, they were cleaned and wrapped in corrugated plastic to protect them during ongoing works. Each board was wrapped separately and labelled to correspond with the floor plan. The boards were stored in adjacent rooms and whilst the works were occurring, and as there was a huge mass of mahogany, which as you can imagine is extremely heavy, we had to have structural engineers ensure that the weight concentrated in these areas would not be too much for the historic building joists. And you can see here the image on the right shows a pile of the floorboards as they've been packed and stored um, during works. Um, during the works, um, the conservation team regularly opened a sample of the packaged floorboards and took humidity readings inside the packages. And that meant that we could check that the boards themselves weren't warping due to a, the environment. Um, and I'm going to say we've got, had no heating at this point, and Sarah will talk about that a bit more later. And the different pressures that the floorboards were used. So after we understood that we would need to remove almost all of the floorboards on the first floor, we ensured we made the most of this opportunity. And in conjunction with our surveyors, we made sure extra floor joists were added to ensure that the structure was protected for the future. And you can see the image on the left, you can see very clearly historic floor joists and then where new ones were added in just to add a bit of extra structural protection. And then we also had fireproofing put down between all of the floor joists and behind the skirtings, which improved the fire protection in the house dramatically. And the image on the right, I think you can see some sort of white underneath the floorboards there, and that's the fire protection going down just before the floorboards are returned. After all the new wiring was laid, the specialist carpenters cleaned the spaces and returned the floorboards one by one using the historic nails and remaking dowels to replace those that were missing. It took about a month for the floorboards to be relayed, and now the floor is much more stable in far better order to withstand foot traffic from our visitors when they return. As another added bonus of the work, all the floor voids were now clean with no buildup of old dirt and debris, as there would be in most historic properties. This reduces the amount of dust in the property, as well as the risk of insect pests that might thrive on dirt and, and then move on to damage some of our collections. OK, going to the next slide. So after the floors had been put back and the majority of the works had been completed, we had a whole new challenge, how to clean the house from top to bottom to prepare for the return of the collections. If anyone listening has ever had any building work done in their house, they will just know just how dusty it can be. And despite all our very careful dust protection, there was still a huge amount of cleaning to be done. And this is where our fantastic team of conservation volunteers came in. They picked up vacuums and paintbrushes and went to work removing the dust from every single surface of the house. The image on the left here shows actually shows Anthony, our community engagement Kickstarter. He was an invaluable part of the team cleaning the house. And here he's removing some of the dust from the staircase using a hog's hair paintbrush to flick dust into a vacuum cleaner. Once the uh, dust was removed from all of the surfaces and all the floors, the floors were then mopped twice to remove as much of the new dust from the building works, as well as old ingrained dust and wax as possible. And you can see from the image on the right, how much dirt was ingrained in the floors. Moving on, once the floors were as clean as they could be, we worked with a consultant conservator and agreed that we should protect the floors for the future when we reopen to the public. 
Um, and we decided that we'd do this with several layers of wax, which would not only improve the look of the floors, but provide layers of protection from visitor footfall. It took a week, a whole week, and a lot of elbow grease from the conservation staff from across the London region, as well as the team of conservation volunteers, all working together to apply one coat of hard wax followed by two coats of softer wax to the floors. After the application of wax, the wax has to be allowed to sink into the wood and we needed to make sure that nobody walked on the uh, floors until the solvents had evaporated and the waxes had hardened. So we came up with some creative barriers that would not damage the building and you can see here our, our creative no end barrier to the staircase to stop anyone using that and ruining our wax finish. And after this the wax had um, seeped into the floorboards we could use an electric floor buffer in the larger spaces but however in the smaller spaces we did still have to do this by hand to buff off all the wax or buff in all the wax. Um, it's very hard work but incredibly satisfying and I think you can see on the image on the uh, left the left hand side has the three layers of wax applied and then the right hand side shows it after it's been buffed so you can imagine how satisfying this process was. And I'm going to hear, talk here a bit more about our conservation volunteers because I really want to celebrate the work that they um, put in to the preparation of the house. I think you by now you'll have got the picture that none of this would have been possible without this wonderful team of volunteers. They gave us so much of their time, expertise, enthusiasm and skill and made all the work to prepare the house possible. And I just want to take this opportunity to say a huge thank you to them. And I'm going to sort of end this section of the talk. Uh, with some lovely before and after image of the gallery floor, which shows three of our volunteer wo um, team working hard to wax the floor in the gallery. And it took two long days for them to go from the image on the left where the floor was dull and stained to the beautifully shiny and well-protected floor on the image to the right. And you can see us standing back to admire their handiwork. And I just want to say that this image really show is a testament to their hard work and I hope that when you come and visit the house when it opens you can really appreciate some of the hidden work that's gone on as you move in and uh, walk on our beautifully polished floors. So I'm now going to hand over to Sarah who will talk a bit more in detail about some of the conservation we had done to our collection. Much as Wendy said the electrics in the house were very dated as was the heating system. It was old, it was unreliable and it used to break down frequently. It also only had one thermostat for the whole system, which, as you can imagine, didn't work very well for a house the size of Marble Hill. The house was either too warm or too cold and also ended up often being too dry. As you can imagine, the collections and interiors are quite sensitive to the wrong humidity and when it gets too dry. So we used to have to plug in humidifiers, so overall not very satisfactory. The old heating system had heaters located in the fireplaces throughout the house. So as not to disrupt the building too much, the new heating system was designed to fit within the fireplaces as well. In order to do this, we first needed to make sure that all the fireplaces were clear so that the old system could be removed. Some, this was easier said than done. And so the picture on the left, uh, which might appear quite comical, uh, is not anyone attempting any poor manual handling, is some extremely hardworking stone specialists who were brought in because at some point some decorative marble linings to the internal parts of the fireplace had been cemented in around the fire grate and so they had to reach over and chip out all of this marble in order to release the fire grate. Um, so it was a huge amount of work for those people to get the fire grate out so we could sort out the heating system for that room. Fortunately, most of the fireplaces were a lot easier to access than that. And then once the new heating system had been designed, there was a concern that the units themselves were going to be larger. So we had to bring the fire grates, which had been removed, back to site to test them in the fireplaces and make sure there was enough space for the new heating units and that we'd be able to get the fire grates back in afterwards. So after a few adjustments to positioning, we knew that everything would fit back in. And here you can just see on the left hand side um, at the back in the fireplace, there is a unit. It's a fan coil unit and that's the new unit fitted into the fireplace. And then on the right hand side, you can see the finished product where the fire grate has been put back in. And we also have a fine uh, mesh in front so that 
you're not able to see the heater, but the air can still flow through into the room. So I know we've just done all that work and then covered it up. But after all, one of the aims of the project is to present the house as Henrietta Howard's home. So we don't want too many modern systems being fully visible within the rooms. Whilst I say, and then it looks the same or you can't see it, there's a big, big other difference that you can't see, which is that we now have a very sophisticated control system. The system is running on what we call conservation heating, which means that the heating is on or off dependent on the humidity, as opposed to on and off dependent on the temperature, as you would normally have for heating in your house. It means that the collections and interiors can be kept comfortable. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't always keep humans so comfortable as it can get quite chilly in winter, but it means that, yeah, we have to do less uh, extra work on those less issues with the rest of the environment for the collection. In every single room, there's one of these small uh, sensors, which is a little black box with a sensor protruding out in an aerial because it's all wireless. And the heater in every single room is controlled by one of these. And so it means that the heating only runs in each room if it's needed. So it's much runs much more efficient manner than the previous uh, system that we had. So as you'll have seen by now, as we had to take up all the floorboards, all of the collection that was in the house had to be removed. As part of this, the paintings which were fitted into the architectural scheme in the great room needed to be taken down. This gave a good opportunity to do some work to some of the paintings. Three of the paintings in the great room are full length portraits measuring about 2.4 meters high and 1.5 meters wide. The one we're looking at here is of King Charles I and Prince Charles and is thought to have been painted around 1635 after Anthony van Dyck. The painting and frame are attached to the wall separately. The frame is made of plaster, which is then gilded, and so it's extremely heavy. So it took a team of around eight conservators and art handlers to carefully remove and lower the frame using various amounts of equipment, as you can see on the left, and then you can see in the middle the frame completely down and separate from the painting. And then that enabled the painting to be removed from the wall afterwards. The paintings were then checked um, before and after uh, moving to check that there was no damage. Once off the wall, we took the chance to give them a clean on both the front and the back. The back was very dirty. At this point, this was done with a soft brush to loosen the dust and a vacuum to capture the dust and make sure it wasn't spread around. A little bit like Wendy was talking about earlier with the staircase, but just being extremely careful on the back of the canvas. The keys in the stretcher, which are the small little wooden blocks sticking out of the main wooden frame, which is what the canvas painting is stretched around, were all checked so that the painting was of the right tension. And then the painting was backed with a plasticized aluminium film. That's what you can see on the right hand side in this picture. But I should just say, because I couldn't find a good picture of uh, Marble Hill, this is actually the same process being undertaken at Apsley House. I don't want to start any rumours that we've hung yellow silks on the walls at Marble Hill as a big change. This is actually at Apsley House. You can back paintings with lots of different types of materials, but this particular one has many benefits. Particularly for large paintings, it's light and easy to cut to sight and manipulated, unlike a solid sort of piece of hardboard or similar. It also doesn't sort of add too much bulk to the painting. So it means there's no problems with fitting the painting back onto the wall and in the frame. But you might be wondering why we'd be adding a backing to the frame at all. So there are a few reasons why we do this. It means that in future, uh, the painting doesn't get so dusty. And it also means that it will protect the back of the canvas against fluctuations in humidity and getting too damp where it's against the wall as any control in the room is less effective for that side of the painting. And it also means that as the painting is being handled and as these paintings had to be packed and taken off site, it means that there's less chance you're going to accidentally touch the back of the canvas and cause any damage to the painting. So many reasons, um, and this was done to most of the paintings in the great room. But of course, once everything's back on the wall, you won't see any of that. So you won't know that all that work's been done if you're just looking at them from the front. But we have taken the opportunity to do some further work to the front surface of the painting. So the painting was cleaned using cotton wool swabs and deionized water. You can hopefully just see in the picture focusing on in 
Prince Charles, you can just see that there's a sort of white film of ingrained dust and dirt is being removed and the colours of the paint are becoming more saturated. And then in the bottom right picture, what you can see is that, so there were some small areas of raised paint and there was a concern that they would end up flaking off. And so we fed in some Lasco, which is a type of acrylic polymer to use it as an adhesive. It's very thin, so it's easy to uh, put manipulate under the raised paint. And then a protective barrier film was put down and a small heated iron applied to just make sure that the adhesive was evenly distributed and so that the paint flakes lay down flat when they dried. And this means they can go back on the wall and there isn't a danger of those raised paint areas flaking off. We also had conservation work done to the lacquer screen. Now this is one of the few objects in the collection that was not only owned by Henrietta Howard, but was made specifically for her. We know this as her arms are included in the design of the screen. It's an eight panel Chinese lacquer screen. It is likely it was made to order in the 1730s at the port of Canton. Chinese uh, Asian lacquer objects are made from the sap of the lacquer tree applied to a substrate, in this case, a wooden panel. The lacquer once hardened can be polished to an amazing shine and then decorative designs can be applied often in rich materials such as gold, silver powders and mother of pearl. Because there are many different types of material then making up this object, they react differently to changes in humidity. And so what you can get, unfortunately, is cracking to the lacquer finish and the decorative finish on the screen. And in the bottom right photo, towards the top of it, just above where you can see the decorative house, hopefully you can see that there's some cracking and also that they're sort of pulling forward. So a little bit like the raised paint flakes I was just talking about, a similar thing was happening to the lacquer on the screen. So thanks to funding from the Pilgrim Trust, we were able to ask Bainbridge Conservation, who specialise in lacquered furniture conservation, to carry out treatment of the screen. So to do this, the screen had to be split into its eight panels, and this meant carefully teasing it apart from its leather bindings and then unscrewing its hinges between each panel. And then in the conservation studio, a special framework was built to accommodate treatment of several of these panels at once. Glue was injected and then massaged into those uh, lacquer, raised lacquer areas that I just showed you on the screen. And then they had gentle pressure applied and held flat whilst the glue dried using an adaptation of the Shimbari technique, which is a technique where sticks are braced against a frame to apply gentle pressure. In this instance, um, the sticks that are used are fiberglass kite making rods, and then they're carefully uh, placed on top of some little perspex blocks, which means that they um, carefully spread the weight. And um, depending on what angle you put them, you can put, apply a little bit more or less pressure, but it's much, much more gentle pressure than if someone was sort of physically just holding their hand, pressing onto it, but it still means that, so it doesn't cause any further damage to the lacquer, but it means that it holds it down flat whilst the glue dries. Once this was completed, the panels were put back together and hopefully you can just about see in the far right hand pictures, the top one is the one I showed you earlier with the raised bits of uh, lacquer and underneath, um, although in slightly better lighting, but is, is the same area of the screen now where you can see that all of those raised bits have been stuck back down. And now it will be going back into a house with much better environmental control. So hopefully it'll be a very long time until we have to undertake any work like that again. So we're continuing to get work on getting the interiors and the collections ready for opening. Anyone who's been in the park recently will know that uh, not only did the scaffolding come down some while ago, but some of the hoardings around the house have now come down. Um, so we're getting there slowly, uh, but there's still, still a work to do, but we look forward to welcoming everyone in spring. But in order to do this, we uh, need your help to open the house to everyone. And we're currently recruiting for volunteers. So if anyone would like to consider this, um, you can find out more by typing Marble Hill Volunteering into Google. But just briefly, there's a minimum requirement, which is for four hours of your time every two weeks. So it would be a small regular commitment, but we would love to have your help 
to open the house up so more people can access their heritage for free. We'll be giving lots of training um, from lots of different specialists across the organization, as well as the team who run the house. So we're not necessarily looking for people with history degrees. We just want people who are really wanting to welcome others to Marble Hill as if it was their own home and love meeting people. So please do consider that if you're interested in Marble Hill. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, we'd be very happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Sarah and Wendy, for um, giving us the most fantastic insight into some of the really, um, really detailed ways the conservation team have been working really hard to, to safeguard our heritage and make sure that it's open for free, but also safeguarding it for the future. So thank you on behalf of all of us here um, who are listening. Um, this is an opportunity for you to ask lots of questions, and you can do that, um, as I mentioned, by going to that chat function at the bottom of the screen. But I've got a few questions questions already that have come in. Both of you work up and down the country in various different properties, don't you, in, for um, English heritage. So Marble Hill is one of your, um, uh, one of the, the, the many properties that you work on. And I wondered whether you had any other properties that you've been working on in a similar way as Marble Hill. Um, Sarah, did you want to share? Yes. Um... Well, a few years ago, I worked on a project at Elton Palace, so another property within London, but a very different property to Marble Hill, for those of you who know it. Uh, it's the remains of a, a Tudor uh, palace, uh, and then there's an exciting 1930s uh, ocean liner style uh, modern building um, on the side. And um, a few years ago, we needed to replace the heating system there. Um, so a bit of a theme. Uh, but there, uh, the 1930s, uh, underfloor heating and integrated heating was all the rage. And so throughout the building, the entire heating system is hidden. So it's much more difficult to access than even that tricky grate uh, at Marble Hill and the fireplace there. Uh, but again, it meant that all the um, sort of building and interiors had to come up, lots of the floors had to come up, and all of the heating pipes had to be replaced. And of course, we try to replace it with underfloor heating as much as um, possible, but it was quite similar in needing to um, protect all the historic interiors. And Eltham has some beautiful uh, veneered wall decoration, um, which is yeah, a particularly tricky project to work around. So um, it was very interesting itself, but yeah, certainly elements a little bit similar to Marble Hill with the heating system. Fantastic, well worth, well worth a visit, um, is Eltham. Um, thank you, Sarah, for sharing. Wendy, how about you? Well, again, a, a few years ago, I worked on a project at Audley End House, which is um, renowned as one of the uh, uh, finest uh, Jacobean houses in uh, England. And there, it was a similar project. We weren't uh, rewiring the house, but we were installing more up-to-date um, CCTV security and uh, fire alarm system. So it was similar in that it um, required lifting of some very, very historic floorboards that had uh, previously had not been lifted for a very long time. Uh, we again uh, worked under the um, with closely with contractors um, of all different kinds, including specialist carpenters. And whilst the work was going on and we had some of the floorboards lifted, we had stabilization works done to um, one of the very important staircases. If you visit Audley End, you will have gone up and down it and not even realized that um, that has had a huge amount of work on it um, recently. I've got another question about the conservation work. It sounds like there's lots been done, someone says. So do we think that everything's been done now? So everything is in a durable condition? Or is this an ongoing process? Um, Sarah, did you want to share about that? I suppose it's a, a bit of both. I mean, it's a large historic building. There's an interesting um, collection. Um, lots of these uh, are made from materials that are very old now. So um, do tend to degrade. So given how much work's gone in, absolutely you hope that it is now in a sustainable condition, but there will still continue to need to be a, a lot of maintenance um, done to make sure that all the hard work um, is sort of capitalised upon in that, you know, we don't have to go back and redo it anytime soon. So that there'll still be a lot of work going on, but not as much. Now we're in the project, hopefully we've reached um, a sort of sustainable um, condition. Um, not everything will have been done in the project. Uh, I think, I don't know whether we'd ever get to, to that point, um, but uh, certainly we're, we've made 
big inroads and hopefully we can just keep on top of that now. And someone says something about um, them being aware that other works were done, things like um, the roofing being supported and also drainage as well, which was obviously a really big problem. Obviously, this is not conservation related, but um, obviously that that happened as part of the project to to secure the safeguarding of the, the history of the, the site. Um, Wendy, would you be able to tell us a bit, a bit more about those elements? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good point. We had a huge amount of work done on the um, outer layer of the building to try and make it watertight. Um, so previously, uh, before uh, Marble Hill was revived, we did have a odd uh, problem with water leaking in when there was heavy rain. Some of the rainwater goods weren't really up to um, the spec of the amount of rain we have now. And some of the drainage around the base of the house had, um, had sunken slightly. So we had... Um, we had some leaks through the roof and we had some areas of damp on the uh, ground floor and as part of the project a lot of work was done um, on the roof as you say uh, roof, uh, parts of the roof were replaced the slates were replaced we had um, some of the windows um, uh, refurbished taken away and conserved and, and brought back again uh, where they were letting water in and moisture in and weren't sealed very well anymore and then a huge amount of groundworks went on where they relayed a French drain around the base of the building and reprofiled the landscape so that the water ran away from the building rather than towards it. So a huge amount of work that hopefully will help the conservation in the end, presumably, because I'm sure damp is a, is a big problem. Um, Sarah, could you tell us what kind of things the damp would be doing? Yeah, well, uh, the damp coming into the house, making the... Um, trying to keep the house uh, not not too damp, you know, difficult when, when water's coming in. I mean, obviously in some cases with uh, leaks um, from the roof, you've actually got liquid water running into uh, historic areas. So lots of mopping up and needing to repair. So hopefully there won't be any of those issues uh, anymore. So yes, that's really, really good news. Um, but also downstairs, I'm sure if people have um, visited, you'll have noticed that the damp along the um, river uh, facing side of the house on the ground floor was particularly bad and had started to disrupt uh, some of the modern wall plaster. Um, so fortunately we've been able to um, repair that, but also then some of the historic floor and the Tetra style hall. So some repairs have been done, um, but really the main thing is that it's not going to get any worse now. Um, we sincerely hope now that this drainage is working, so that's going to make um, a huge difference. Um, and we also just some of the practical issues that where the plaster was blowing off it was also next to the old electrics so we had damp and old electrics and so we weren't able to have lights in some of the rooms um so now we do have lights that might not be historic but hopefully that will immeasurably enhance the visitor experience when you can actually uh, see the rooms uh, and the electrics won't be dangerous so uh, yeah there's there's lots of benefits to that um so it's really good we've been able to do that and um yeah as i say once we keep on top of the the maintenance now that the, those sort of big works have been done um it's going to be a much more sustainable future for the building i think that's one of the really exciting aspects of the project is that actually you know it just means that everything will stay standing and stay dry um as well as all the kind of fantastic work that you've been doing on various different parts of uh, the collection to just make sure that it's it's there for the future and i've just got one last question to finish off with obviously you've got some amazing collections within the Mar in marble hill house i wonder whether you might be able to share your most favorite uh, piece of um the collection um, Wendy, can I go to you first? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think one of the things that I was my favourite thing at Marble Hill is actually the long case clock. That is a lovely, um, uh, it's a lovely long case clock. It's got beautiful cherubs carved onto its hood. And what I really like about it is that when it's working and when it chimes, you can hear that chime throughout the house and it makes the house feel like it comes alive. So I really, that's one of my favourite pieces at Marble Hill. I have to say, I think that is the same for me. The sound does resonate throughout all of the walls. It is wonderful. So we can't wait for you to come and enjoy uh, Wendy's favourite part of the collection. Sarah, can you tell me about yours? I think mine has to be the uh, portrait of uh, Henrietta. Uh, by Charles Jarvis, uh, which is, um, yeah, now prominently displayed. And I just think it's, for, it's such a beautiful painting and it's lovely to be able to see uh, a likeness of the 
lady who was so remarkable and, and built the house and who owned these collections. So I think, I think that's my favourite object. I couldn't agree more. And uh, it's going to be lovely that she's welcoming everyone. Um, thank you so much for the huge amount of work that you've, you've done for Marble Hill and also for sharing that this evening. We've got some lovely comments um, from, from the team. So thank you everyone for being here. And please remember that you can come and be part of the Revive through uh, volunteering or having a cup of coffee at the cafe. Um, do come and visit us and we can't wait for you to all come and be part of uh, Marble Hills Revival when we open in the spring. Huge thanks. Thank you, Sarah. And huge thanks, um, Wendy, uh, for your time and energy. And thank you for sharing so generously this evening. Good night, everybody.